A report has claimed that the RAF have placed an effective pause on hiring white males in order to assist in the organisation's efforts to meet their diversity quota. The RAF has denied the claim, but the head of the recruitment team has quit amidst the controversy. Uh, ben Obsijecti from the Advisory Council at Don't Divide Us is a former infantry officer and he wrote about this in The Telegraph earlier this week. And I, he joins me tonight. Ben, welcome. So, I read about this story earlier in the week. I think it's really fascinating. But before we sort of get into the nuts and bolts of it, can you tell us your experience um, as an infantryman? You, you were in the army yourself. Yeah, so I joined the, I joined the army sort of at the age of 23 um, and served for, for nine years. Um, I was an infantry officer, um, so I commissioned from Sandhurst. Uh, I went on to, to serve in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and left um, sort of roughly around oh, 10 years ago now. Yes. Um, but uh, but a, an outstanding career and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. So, I mean, this is an area that I know nothing about, the military, but I do know something about the diversity industry, and I find it quite interesting that these two things have come together in this way. Um, as someone who has had that experience, do you feel that when uh, diversity as a concept is prioritised, it can have a detrimental effect on the effectiveness of the armed forces? Um, it's, a, it's such a strange one because, for me, uh, I was someone who didn't grow up in a military household, um, I didn't, wasn't exposed to, to the military environment, and yet I still, of my own volition, decided to join the army uh, and, and had a, a great career there. Um, but it was noticeable that, that I was one of very few uh, sort of ethnic minority people, especially as an officer, um, and, and, but more widely as a, as a soldier. We had probably more foreign and Commonwealth soldiers than we had um, soldiers who were, who were um, British-born. So for me, it was, it was quite... Yeah, that was a quite an interesting experience. It was something that I noticed, but it wasn't something that was that was an issue. Yes. Um, and so for it to now be raised that, that the army wants to increase its diversity um, statistics and sort of the, the armed forces in general wants to increase its um, diversity status means that there is always going to be some friction in the manner in which they choose to do that. And I think that's where that's where the problem potentially comes. Is there a fear that if you implement these kind of quotas, you might not always go for the best person for the job? And you mentioned in your article that actually in these sort of life and death situations, you always need the, the best person for the job. That's got to be the priority. Absolutely the case. And, and the RAF has been very quick to, to come out and say that um, there's been no impact on the actual the operational capability of the armed forces, that, that everybody who's been selected has been above the quality line. Uh, and so everyone that's being put through is, is of a sufficient standard. Yes. And that may be the case. But the problem is that when you start to prioritise people based on their gender or their ethnicity, you are automatically excluding other people who may well be as good a standard, if not better. Um, and it's vital that we always get the people who are the best people for the job, especially on operations. Um, I think as a, as a country, now that the likes of Iraq and Afghanistan have faded from consciousness a little bit, less for the, the recent discussions around, around Kabul, um, we've kind of forgotten the tempo of operations that we were operating at around 10 years ago uh, and, and sort of between 2003 and, and 2013. Um, and the vast, vast sort of sacrifice that individuals were required to do um, just simply means that you have to have people who are of the best quality. Um, and that's not always going to be the case uh, in terms of always going to be possible. Um, but it's so important that we strive for that. I mean, I can understand that if there are incidents of racism or homophobia or whatever within the army, that has to be rooted out, that has to be dealt with. But this is a sort of different thing, isn't it? This is about the recruitment process. And my understanding, as limited as it is, is that when you go into the army, it's, it's not so much about your individuality, your own identity. It's about kind of being subsumed into a collective identity. Have I got that wrong? No, 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 absolutely. I, I spent two years in, in a recruitment, uh, sort of army training regiment, um, training recruits. And you so quickly have to take the individual as they were, rough around the edges, obviously not suited to go from civilian to soldier in, in an afternoon, um, and you quickly sort of build that cohesion. You, you teach people what you want from them. You teach them the, 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 the values and standards that the army requires in order to bring them up to a, a point where they can work as a team, mm. as a member of a team. And, and that's what the armed forces are. They are effectively a, a huge team broken down into, into smaller teams. Um, and at every level, somebody has to be able to operate with their, the people around them. You have to be able to rely on the person left of you and the person to the right of you. Well, that, that community is so important, isn't it? Because you're effectively asking people to put your life in their hands and vice versa. A absolutely. And, and to that extent, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force very quickly breaks people down and builds them back up in the image in which they want them to operate. Yes. And, and the only culture that really exists is the culture of the arm or service that you're in. And it, and it is different between the, the three major, major services, but each one has its own 
uh, its own culture and, and with it, you know, its own language, its, its own style of operation. But that's what you're pulling everyone towards. And it doesn't matter what your gender is or what your ethnicity is. It's about whether you can operate in that cohesive team. I think a lot of the time, a lot of people don't really understand that mindset because they haven't served, and so they don't know what that, what that feels like. Um, but do you think that, that that might be part of this, the fact that these kinds of um, equity and diversity initiatives, which sort of originate in the corporate world, in the world of HR, suddenly being mapped onto this entirely different context, and really they don't fit very neatly? I mean, in this instance, it very much seems that this is just a case of meeting an arbitrary target that somebody has set because it has been deemed that we, are, we have under-recruited in, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, ethnic minorities. Um, and, and looking at that and looking at the fact that they're just desperate to get bums on seats, effectively, mm. in order to, to be able to say, well, we hit our target, we've got 2.5 or 2.7 percent um, of ethnic minorities, means that you are in danger of, of losing the bigger picture, um, and which is effectively the operational capability of your force, getting the best people through the door, um, and, and making sure that, that that's the case. Because in the corporate world, you can lean on into the cultures of, of the various people that, that uh, join in order to, to sort of broaden the horizons of the people that, that are there. But in the armed forces, you're making everybody work to the culture that, that you set, yes. which is that of the armed forces. And so people aren't going to invest time in, in learning about the rich cultural heritage of, of various individuals it, because it's not going to have any influence on the overall organisation. No, of course. Do you think that the notion of representation, and I, mean, I take this because one of the arguments presented uh, when, when this argument came up was that it's important that the armed forces are representative of the country they, they represent, right? So I can see how that might be important in a policing situation where you have people who, who, who are within the communities that they serve. How important is that concept of representation when it comes to the army? It's, it's, it's such a complex uh, sort of scenario. I mean, obviously, for the police, you are you are intrinsic to the community, you are seen on the ground, you have to interact with people on a daily basis. Mm. Most people have very little interaction with the armed forces. Um, unless you live in a, a garrison town or, or you live in Portsmouth or, or something like that, you're, you're not going to come across the, the, the armed forces on a particularly regular basis. And therefore, that, that sort of civil military uh, interaction is, is far less important. In mm. terms of representation, I don't think anybody is, is sitting around wondering or worrying, in fact, whether we have the right amount of black people or Asian people serving on the, on the front line. I think people just want to know that the Army or the Navy or the Air Force works as it is intended to work. Well, a lot of people uh, argue that any kind of disparity in outcome when it comes to recruitment is a sign of uh, a kind of ingrained institutional racism within the system. Do you think the Army has a problem with racism? I don't think the army has a problem with racism. Um, I wouldn't have spent nine years in the army if it, if it, if it did. Um, I think there is a perception that the army has a problem with racism. And I think um, sort of historically, um, if we look back to sort of before my time in the 70s and the 60s, I, I would be very surprised if there, were, there weren't a, sort of a number of, of horrendous incidents. But this is 2022 and, and the army has quietly become a very progressive organization in terms of the way that it deals with, with bad behavior. We saw um, late last year there was um, a number of incidents with senior officers in the army um, and that led to some serious questions being asked at the very highest level about the culture that existed. Mm. Uh, I remember seeing um, various senior officers on, on television sort of defending uh, the, the manner in which the army was operating in order to, because of the uncomfortable work, the dirty and dangerous work that it's required to do. Um, and so there have been moves to, to address that and I think they've been very positive moves and it's one that, that makes the army a more sort of a more welcoming and a, and a slightly softer, dare I say, at place. Yes. Um, and that's not necessarily always going to be what you need, but at the same time, the vast majority of time isn't spent on operations, so you need people to, to be willing to stay in the organisation in order to get the best out well, of them. Does it need to be soft? I mean, isn't the army a I military think, force meant no, to be No, no, sorry, I, I, maybe I didn't articulate that sort of well enough. I think sort of toxic behaviours are, are the, those things that you need to, to, to make sure that, that are kept out. Um, in terms of it being a, a sort of a tough environment, I think the very nature of the work means that you're always going to ask a lot from people. Um, but at the same time, the people that you've, you've got in place are equipped to do that. And yes. that's the, the, the whole process of the recruitment um, process is in order to get the right people at the sharp do, end. Do you ever fear, though, that th these kind of diversity initiatives can sometimes um, change the public perception of the armed forces in a really negative way? I mean, I'm thinking of on the day that Putin invaded Ukraine, a story was broken about, the MI, about MI6 and MI5 uh, urging spies to address their white privilege. 
On the day of the invasion, there was also a tweet from the Ministry of Defence talking about how great their LGBT coffee morning that was that day and how they discussed pansexuality. Doesn't that make them look like... Well, it looks foolish. It's, it's very much a case of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. And, mm. and, and I think that, that you have to look at it holistically and you have to recognise that, that the public perception of the armed forces is very different to the way that the armed forces perceives itself internally. Yes. And I think so there are a lot of people in the armed forces who've been in the armed forces for a long time. And, and there is a lot of institutionalisation within that. If you've spent 20 or even longer in, in the army, then you're going to have a, a slightly skewed sort of uh, appreciation of just how people see things from the outside. And so it is worth sort of addressing those kind, of, those kind of issues. I think on the subject of diversity, the work that, that they do in, in terms of sort of diversifying their workforce is, is one that they should be doing simply so that they can get, ensure that they have the most people engaged in order to get the best people from that. I don't think it's a case of making sure that you can meet quotas and numbers. It's making sure that you can engage as many people as possible to get the best people in the job. And if you happen to diversify your workforce in the process, then, then that's a, obviously a, a massive bonus. Ben, obviously, thanks very much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Uh, we do... Uh... We do have a, a statement from the RAF, which is only fair to read. This is an RAF spokesman said, there is no pause in Royal Air Force recruitment and no new policy with regards to meeting in-year recruitment requirements. Royal Air Force commanders will not shy away from the challenges we face, building a service that attracts and recruits talent from every part of the UK workforce. As with the Royal Navy and British Army, we are doing everything we can to encourage recruiting from underrepresented groups and ensure we have a diverse workforce.